Hi, I'm Brent Johnson, and today I don't have an organ for you, but I wanted to share with you one of the videos from the uh, American Institute of Organ Builders convention that was held this past fall in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, I was able to share one of these last year from their convention in 2022. Again, in 2023, there was a great uh, talk that I thought would appeal to, to many of you who are interested in organ building and organ history. Uh, this was given by Matthew Bellocchio, who's a very familiar face by now. He helped us with many of our videos in Massachusetts last fall. Um, and he was giving a lecture he'd given before. He had updated it. And this is a topic that he's hoping to maybe someday write a book about. So uh, it would be a great one to explore. It's called Time, Taste, and the Organ Case. And he talks about how organ case design uh, has changed throughout history and has followed trends and style designs of the, of the times and periods. So my thanks to Mark Hudson Piller and Matthew Bellocchio from the American Institute of Organ Builders for letting me share this with you. If you'd like to find out more about the AIO, there's information down below in the description. If you would uh, like to maybe be a member and attend their conferences and see all these lectures and all this great information they have to share, uh, you can find out more about becoming a member down there. Uh, but for now, let's uh, go to Matthew in Charlottesville with Time, Taste, and the Organ Case. Thanks to the AIO, uh, I've learned many things which have helped make me the organ builder I am today. Specifically, this lecture owes its existence to two people whom I met at the 1979 AIO Boston Convention. The first person was Michael Gillingham, an English antiquarian and consultant for many notable historic organ restorations. He gave a slide lecture titled Stylistic Development in English Organ Cases from 1600 to 1800. He illustrated how English organ case styles were influenced by the furniture styles of their day. This was a revelation to me. I had previously assumed that organ builders were an inbred group who kept recycling a few limited case designs. His lecture opened my eyes to the link between organ cases and the decorative arts. The second person whom I met at the 1979 convention was a young woman who worked for the Berkshire Organ Company, Lisa Compton. After college graduation, she had been a summer fellow at historic Deerfield, a museum village in central Massachusetts. She later had a second career as the director of the History Museum in Taunton, where I then worked. After we married, we occasionally attended seminars at historic Deerfield, where I learned about the study of material culture and how to forensically look at pieces of furniture and determine when they were made and what had subsequently been done to them. Michael Gillingham opened my eyes and Lisa Compton sharpened them. So with gratitude, I dedicate this lecture to their memories. In 1999, the City Council of Portland, Oregon unanimously voted to ban the construction of snout houses. The term snout house describes a style that is rampant in American suburbia. Viewed from the street, its most prominent feature is a large, multi-bayed garage. The house portion is attached somewhere to the side or rear. The city council felt that this style of house, designed for the convenience of the automobile driver, depersonalizes neighborhoods and reduces opportunities for social interactions among neighbors. During the hearings on this issue, one of the most interesting pieces of evidence presented was a study conducted by a professor of city planning at Ohio State University. It was about people's perception of house styles. In this study, 118 adults in Columbus were shown pictures of homes in six different styles, farm, salt box, colonial, Tudor, Mediterranean, and contemporary. They were then asked which house they would go to for help if their car broke down. <laughs> they were also asked to identify in which house the community's upper crust lived. Interestingly, there was very strong consensus in the Columbus responses. People would go to the friendly looking farm style house for help with their car troubles. They thought that the elite families lived in the stately Tudor or colonial houses. Surprisingly, when this study was repeated in Los Angeles, where typical housing is utterly unlike that in Columbus, 102 adults gave nearly identical responses. Perhaps you cannot judge a book by its cover, but these studies suggest that many people form impressions about the occupants of a house based upon its exterior. The same thing can happen with organs. What impressions could we form about this one from the visual clues it gives us. It has a compact, freestanding case, no ornament, natural length facade pipes, 
a vertical arrangement of manual divisions, a secondary division and brustwork position, draw knobs and flat jams, built-in keyboards, and a 58-note manual compass. When was it built? Oh, probably in the 60s or 70s. What does it sound like? Probably thin and bright. What is the action light? Probably a light mechanical action. This organ is in Portland, Oregon. A friend told me that the first time he tried it, he thought, gee, this is the strangest feeling tracker I've ever played. He later discovered why. It's not a tracker at all. It's a 1965 electric action Gress Miles. <laughs> a apparently, many organists were initially fooled. Why? Because its form and visual style are that of a tracker. Forms and styles carry messages, often very strong ones. Just what do we mean by style? For our purposes today, style may be considered as a specific or characteristic manner of execution, construction, or design in any art, period, or work. The Oxford English Dictionary defines architectural style as a definite type of architecture distinguished by special characteristics of structure and ornament. Throughout history, structural and decorative styles have evolved to express the spirit of the cultures which gave them birth. Nearly all objects of material culture contain stylistic clues about how the people who created them viewed themselves, their time, and those objects. These clues can be seen in both con in consumer products such as clothing and cars and in more permanent items such as buildings, furniture, and pipe organs. Today, I'll show you how the pipe organ as an artifact of Western musical and material culture continually change its appearance to conform to changing tastes in architecture and the decorative arts. I'll show you how reproductions of older styles have periodically occurred in architecture and in organ cases. They're called revivals. I will also show you some of the case designs of the 19th century, which that, that some of those case designs, which we now consider old-fashioned, were actually quite progressive in their day. I'll start with some European examples to illustrate historic precedents and stylistic developments, and then focus primarily on American architecture and organs. Before we learn about the various styles, let's consider how they spread. We can summarize the process in four words. Creation, acclamation, publication, and imitation. The process works something like this. First, an artist creates something in a new or altered style. Second, the new object is noticed and acclaimed for its originality, beauty, utility. Third, people publish the news about this new thing. This spreads awareness and appreciation of the object. Here, we see people gathering fodder for their Instagram or Facebook pages. <laughs> in early times, people recorded their impressions with sketches or paintings. The invention of printing and later improvements in publishing greatly accelerated this transmission process. Since the 15th century, many architectural styles have been spread through printed materials, some of which I will refer to today. In the final stage, other craftsmen visit or read about the celebrated object and imitate aspects of it in their own work. This imitation can range from an exact copy to a highly edited adaptation. The practice of imitating or copying an important work has a long tradition and was once considered an essential part of the education process. Here, we see monks copying scripture. As they say, monk he see, monk he do. <laughs> In many art and architecture schools, one traditionally spent the first few years studying and copying the old masters before being permitted to do original work. Of course, the trouble with every great work of art, be it a building, a painting, or a pipe organ, is that it inspires both good and bad imitations, as we shall see. Today, I will talk about some architects who started or revived architectural styles, some printed works which popularize them, and some organ cases which reflect them. Time, taste, and the organ case. It's a fascinating story. So 
let's begin at the beginning. Many European organs of the past four centuries have cases which reflect the forms, values, or language of Greek or Roman classical architecture. So do many 19th century American organs, such as this one. George Hersey, in his book, The Lost Meaning of Classical Architecture, observes that Greco-Roman classicism was, quote, was not only the architecture of the Greeks and the Romans and of their empires, it was also the architecture of Romanesque Europe and of Byzantium, of the Renaissance and the Baroque, Beaux-Arts and fascism. It is even, in a peculiar way, a contributor to postmodernism, end quote. Greek classical architecture developed over a thousand year period from 1100 to 146 BC. Greek architecture is classified into three principal styles called orders, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. The quickest way to identify an order is to look at the capital on the top of the column. Let's briefly review each style. The Doric on the left is the oldest and simplest of the three orders. A Doric column has a simple ring-like capital and a rather stout shaft with vertical ridges called flutes. Because of its simple nature and its stout columns, it's considered the strongest, most masculine of the three orders. For example, it was deemed appropriate for generals' houses or military buildings. Next came the Ionic order in the center. Its columns are a bit more slender than the Doric. Its capitals have two curly cues called volutes. Some people interpret them as the curled up ends of an open parchment scroll set face down on the top of the column. For this reason, the Ionic order is generally associated with reading or writing. Thus, it was frequently used for buildings which housed courts, libraries, or anything having to do with arts and letters. Finally, we come to the Corinthian order on the right, the latest and most elaborate of the Greek orders. Its column proportions are the most slender. Its capital contains stylized acanthus leaves and corner volutes. Of the three Greek orders, the Corinthian is the most elegant and ornamented and thus considered the most feminine. This order was judged appropriate for buildings where elegance, gaiety, or magnificence were required. It was often used for galleries and theaters. There's an easy way to keep track of which style is which. The word Doric has two syllables. Ionic has three syllables. Corinthian has four syllables. As the number of syllables increases, the capital decoration becomes more ornate. Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, or DIC without the K. <laughs> now that you know all about the three Greek orders, let's add two more. The Romans adopted the Greek architectural styles and added downgrade and upgrade models, which you see on the right. The Tuscan order is basically a stripped down version of the Doric with slightly beefier column proportions, but no fluting. The composite order at the right is a high end upgrade of the Corinthian. The same capital proportions, but with a few more bells and whistles on it. There is one important characteristic which distinguishes Greek architecture from Roman. There were no arches in ancient Greece. Every door lintel or span atop columns was straight across. It was the Romans who invented the semicircular arch, which we call appropriately the Roman arch. So if it has a curved arch, it's Roman. If there's no arch, it's probably Greek. After the fall of the Roman Empire in the sixth century, Western Europe entered the so-called Dark Ages. The study and perpetuation of art and architecture underwent a period of dormancy and survived largely thanks to the monastic tradition. It was not until the time of Charlemagne, who we see here on the left, around 800 AD that any centralized art form emerged again. Charlemagne united France, Germany, and much of Italy together under his control as the Holy Roman Empire. On the right was his palace chapel at Aix la Chapelle, which is the present German town of Aachen. He recruited artists and craftsmen for both East and West they built his churches in a style which was a naive interpretation of Roman building styles. Thus was born the Romanesque style, whose chief characteristics are thick, massive wall structures, round arches, 
and column capitals with deep cut stylized foliage. This style lasted until the advent of Gothic architecture in the middle of the 12th century. My reason for including this style is that we will encounter it again in the 19th century. It was during the Romanesque period that the pipe organ began to evolve. Here we see a 9th century illustration of a hydralis, the organ in its infancy. Now, like most newborns, it, it has no clothing, water fills its lungs, and it lets out a piercing wail. <laughs> Baby pictures are always embarrassing, but don't worry. In a few centuries, it will grow up, get dressed, and become respectable. The Gothic style originated in France in the mid-12th century. By the mid-13th century, it had spread throughout the rest of Europe. It was known then as Opus Modernum, modern work, or Opus Francigenium, work of French origin. The term Gothic was coined in the 17th century by those who thought the style looked primitive and barbaric. Gothic architecture was a structural revolution. The heavy, thick walls of the Romanesque gave way to the thin lines of column shafts, vaulting ribs, flying buttresses, and window tracery. Interiors were divided into a succession of ribbed cells. Masonry mass was reduced to the minimum necessary for structural support and replaced with expanses of stained glass windows. The Gothic architectural style lasted for approximately 400 years, from the mid-12th century to the mid-16th century. It went through three major stylistic periods, early, high, and late. As the style progressed, it became more elaborate. Early Gothic architecture was a very efficient and honest form of structure. Architectural decoration was mainly an enrichment of the essential structural elements of the building. Early Gothic furniture consisted mainly of simple joinery with some carved ornaments such as tracery or linen fold panels. The English coronation chair in Westminster Abbey dates from the late 13th century and is typical of early Gothic furniture. It's a rather simple piece. The earliest extant Gothic organs have relatively simple casework with flat fronts and uncomplicated lines. Decoration is used mainly as an enrichment of flat or blank areas, such as the tracery pipe shades or the incised panel work. This organ in Zion, Switzerland dates from the 1430s. Perhaps its case arrangement was inspired by a castle or church facade of the period with towers flanking the gabled roof of the nave. We see the same simplicity in this Italian case from the 1470s in San Petronio, Bologna. Again, we see a flat front and geometrically inspired carved and painted ornament. Now, disregard the ornamental shell around it as it is from a later period. In the High Gothic period, architectural structures became three-dimensional and the ornament more fluid. The front of this late 1400s French cupboard projects outward at the center and has more sophisticated tracery. This organ case from 1481, presently in the Korenkirk in Middleburg in the Netherlands, is one of the earliest to have projecting towers. We can tell from the three-dimensional pipe arrangement and the more elaborate carved decorations that is from a later period than the scion organ. The late Gothic phase is often called flamboyant because of the flowing flame-like shape of the window tracery, as we see here, and the more elaborate decoration. This organ at St. Nicholas Kirk, uh, Nuringen Juptpas in the Netherlands, from the mid-1500s, leaves little doubt that it is from the florid late Gothic period. It's very busy, both in plan and ornament. One thing becomes apparent in looking at Gothic period instruments is that they appear very un-Gothic to our modern eyes. There are few Gothic arches to be found in Gothic period organ cases. Pointed arch pipe flats with heavily ornamented gables above, as we see on this 1845 urban organ in Charleston, South Carolina, were a naive invention of 19th century Gothic revival. In the 14th century, most of Europe was in high Gothic mode. But in Italy, 
scholars began to take serious interest in antiquity, both in buildings and in ancient writings and philosophies. Long forgotten manuscripts in monastic libraries were rediscovered and studied. This led to a new philosophy called humanism, which combined medieval Christian and ancient Roman thought. People began to seriously study and codify the design features of ancient Roman buildings and use them as a source of inspiration for the creation of new works. This revival of classical art and learning eventually spread through Europe and became known as the Renaissance from the French word for rebirth. One of the most important manuscripts to come to light was the only known surviving Roman treatise on architecture, written by Vitruvius around 25 BC. This is an illustration from the first printed edition of 1490. Vitruvius described the universe as an architectural structure, and from it he derived laws for architecture based upon proportion and geometry. From this arose the Renaissance idea of a building being not merely an expression of structure and proportion, but an expression of heavenly harmony as well. The invention of the printing press in the 15th century greatly added the spread of the new Renaissance style. Over the next 100 years, several Italians wrote treatises which codified the rules of classical architecture and this explained the use of the five orders. Andrea Palladio's 1570 treatise called The Four Books of Architecture would become the most influential architectural design manual for the next two centuries in Europe and her colonies, and that includes the first 150 years in America. Palladio was an architect who adapted ancient Roman forms for a new style of classically inspired architecture, which we now call Palladian. His first commission in 1549 was to surround the old Palazzo Comunale in Vincenza with a classical wrapping of columns and arches. The motif he used, which we see on the right, was a three-part opening whose center section has a rounded arch. It came to be known as a Palladian window. As a result of these published treatises, building facades became more sculptural, more three-dimensional. Windows and doorways were framed with columns and square columns known as pilasters. Incidentally, the rounded pediment you see here is called a segmented pediment because its curve is a segment of a circle. As building facades became more sculptural, so did organ cases. The first cases in this new style appeared in Italy where they set a pattern that became the norm in that country for several centuries. This 1536 case in Brescia is typical of the Italian style. The case is now an architectural composition shaped like a large doorway or small temple. Ionic columns at each side support an entablature surmounted by a pediment. Another characteristic feature of Renaissance cases is the riot of three-dimensional carved ornament, much of it based on ancient Roman interior decoration. Here's a French case from 1542 in Cotebec en Coeur. The French developed a liking for rounded towers topped by little shrines or tabernacles. Notice again the very busy carvings and uh, ignore the positive case, it's from 200 years later. Because of religious warfare during much of the 16th century, parts of Holland and Germany did not fully embrace the Renaissance style until the early 17th century. This 1618 case in Zerzogenbosch in the Netherlands is a good example of a typical Dutch facade layout with fine late Renaissance carvings. Notice the architectural elements, the elaborately ornamented cornice and the columns which separate the pipe fields. In the mid 16th century, Italian artists began to grow weary of the limited regimented design possibilities of classical art. They began to experiment and distort the classical details and rules in order to create shock and drama. Everything on a building seems at first to look fine and then one notices a detail which intrigues the eye and puzzles the mind, a kind of architectural joke. This style is known as mannerism. Look at this 1580 doorway at the Uffizi in Florence. The segmented pediment, which would normally be round, has been chopped in half and reversed. 
The pilasters which support it can barely be seen because, because they are behind the overgrown door casing. You ask yourself, why did they do something so strange? The answer is mannerism. There are mannerist traces in some early English organ cases. Because of the civil and religious wars, the Renaissance style did not catch on in England until the mannerist period. At King's College Chapel in Cambridge, the pipe flats use slanting toe boards and curving tops to give the illusion of receding perspective. This was a common English mannerist device. We see it more clearly in this 1657 Dalham case in the cathedral at Saint-Paul-de-Lyon in France, where the Dalhams lived while the organ-hating Puritans ruled England. During the second half of the 16th century, most of Europe had been wracked by religious warfare as Protestants and Catholics fought for their beliefs. By 1625, the tide of Protestantism had been checked. The Roman Catholic Church turned from a defensive mode to a celebratory one. It initiated a period of building in which exuberant architecture would show the faithful that, despite the Protestant Reformation, Catholicism was still triumphant. The resulting style is characterized as sweeping, flowing, and ornate. The senses are overwhelmed by visual splendor and dynamic movement. Its detractors call the style Baroque. That name comes from the Portuguese term for a deformed pearl. And in case you were wondering, Baroque jewelers use such deformed pearls to make amazing pieces, such as these figures in the Royal Collection at Dresden. The architect whose work first gave expression to the Baroque style was Gian Lorenzo Bernini. His most famous creation is the baldacchino, or canopy, completed in 1633 in St. Peter's in Rome. This bronze canopy above the main altar is over 95 feet high and is supported on four elaborate twisted columns. It transcends the boundaries dividing architecture and sculpture. This, in a nutshell, defines Baroque architecture. The other great master of the Italian Baroque was Bernini's contemporary, Francesco Borromini. In his famous facade for the Church of St. Charles of the Four Fountains in Rome, Borromini took architecture several steps beyond Bernini. This facade is a play of concave and convex curves which create an undulating wave-like sense of motion in the wall. With architecture like this, buildings became fun houses. Due to the religious wars, the Baroque style didn't really catch on in Germany until the early 1700s. But this late start was more than compensated for by the highly decorative German version of the Baroque style known as Rococo. To the sweeping curves and undulating surfaces of the Italian Baroque style, German architects added a riot of plaster decoration. It reached its peak in the opulent palaces and pilgrimage churches designed by architects such as Balthasar Neumann, who assimilated and surpassed the Italian style. This is his church of the Fitzen Heiligen, the 14 saints in Franconia. One sees early Baroque influences in the curvy front organ cases of Gottfried Silbermann, where there is a sweeping sense of movement. Rococo organ cases, such as Weingarten, seem to grow out of the ornament of their buildings. They are musical architectural props in an 18th century religious prototype of Disneyland. <laughs> in England, the Baroque was carried out with typical British restraint. One historian has said that English Baroque is not a style of movement, but of eccentric solidity. This style is best exemplified in the work of Christopher Wren. This is his 1672 church of St. Stephen Walbrook in London. Following the Great Fire of London in 1666, Wren was appointed general director for the rebuilding of the city. During the next 16 years, he designed 52 new churches in London, including St. Paul's Cathedral. Here's another view of St. Stephen's showing the 1765 George England case. 
With Wren's introduction of Baroque classicism into churches, British organ builders changed their case designs to suit the new architecture. Architecturally inspired five sectional cases with elegant proportions, classically profiled moldings, and richly carved pipe shades and imposts became the norm. This 1743 Thomas Griffin organ in St. Helps, Helen's Bishopgate has the Baroque sense of movement in its pipe flats. The tops, toe boards, and front surfaces are all OG shaped, that is, S curved. The 18th century is often referred to as the Age of Enlightenment. The study of the natural sciences became popular and the systematization of knowledge began. In Sweden, Linnaeus developed a system for the classification of plants and animals. In England, Samuel Johnson compiled the first English dictionary. In France, Diderot initiated the Encyclopedia Project, which set out to publish descriptions of all the known sciences, arts, and trades. Dom Bédot wrote his famous treatise on the art of organ building as part of this project. This was the age in which Bach composed his masterpieces. This was also the century in which America became independent and American organ building began. This is the old state house in Boston built in 1712. Architectural styles had gone over the top with the Baroque and the Rococo. In the 18th century, they underwent a pendulum swing back towards restraint. There were several reasons for this. People began to travel more widely and as a result, became aware of other styles of architecture. The discovery and excavation of the ruins of Pompeii and Herculaneum in Italy sparked renewed interest in classical Roman decoration. Also, for the first time, the buildings of ancient Greece were studied and documented. In the Enlightenment climate of England and France, pure classicism was seen as a rational style in contrast to the emotional excesses of the Baroque. All of this stirred a move among architects towards greater fidelity to the ancient models. An architect's reputation was enhanced if he had studied or published original research on ancient buildings. This dignified neoclassicism was soon reflected in public buildings, churches, and organ cases on both sides of the Atlantic. James Gibbs's 1721 Church of St. Martin in the Fields in London was widely admired. In 1728, he published drawings of all his works in his Book of Architecture which became a pattern book for many American church builders. The St. Martin in the Fields chancel feature of a large Palladian window was imitated in countless American colonial churches of that period. The organ case at Saint-Sulpice, built for the 1779 Clicquot organ, is a consummate example of French neoclassical design. It was designed by architect Jean-Francois Chalgrin, who also designed the Arc de Triomphe. He obviously intended this case to represent a temple of music. It makes an attractive shrine for the world-famous Cavier Cole instrument it now houses. Along with architecture, furniture underwent a change as well. The last phase of neoclassicism is called the Empire Style because of its association with the French Emperor Napoleon. It used motifs from Imperial Rome, Ancient Greece, and Egypt to create an impression of monumental splendor. The introduction of woodworking machinery in the late 1700s had a profound effect on furniture construction. Pieces with structural simplicity and straight lines, which could be turned out by machine, became the style. Gilded cast metal mounts replace delicate carvings. Richly figured veneers such as mahogany and rosewood were applied and finished with a lustrous French polish. Combinations of brass and dark wood became the chief characteristics of the style. This is an empire style 1830 Henry Urban chamber organ in Winston-Salem, restored by Taylor and Booty. This is George Hook's Opus One, built in 1827. It has empire features, but we can also see other influences appearing in the ionic capitals above the pipes on the outside towers. Following the War of Independence, 
a new American architectural style evolved. It utilized simplified neoclassical features, curved or elliptical elements, and elongated windows. This style is known as Federals since it came into vogue just after the Constitution was ratified and the federal government came into being. It is epitomized by the work of Charles Bullfinch, whose buildings transformed Boston from a provincial capital into an elegant city. This is Fanel Hall in Boston, which Bullfinch skillfully enlarged in 1806 to its present form. Bullfinch never published his designs, but another New Englander, Asher Benjamin, translated Bullfinch's style into words and illustrations. Beginning in 1797, Benjamin published a series of handbooks or builder's guides. They contained practical information on geometry, carpentry, and structure, plus architectural plans and decorative details. These served as the only architectural education for many New England carpenters and builders. His most famous book is The American Builder's Companion, which went through six editions between 1806 and 1827. In the 1820s, a new decorative style based on Greek motifs evolved. This Greek revival style evoked the ancient Greek republics and also symbolized the democratic ideals of the young American nation. Over the next three decades, the style spread throughout the country. The 1827 edition of Asher Benjamin's American Builder's Companion contained information on the new Grecian style that was replacing the federal style. Soon, Churches, banks, and courthouses in every American town came to resemble Greek temples. During this period, American organs began a transition as the Greek revival style influenced case design. The federal style is epitomized by the elegant mahogany cases of Thomas Appleton, such as this 1830 instrument in Nantucket, Massachusetts. The design and details of Appleton's cases make them among the most refined ever produced in this country. In the next step, the pipe flats lose their curved tops, as you see here in this 1831 Appleton, now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. This 1840 ENGG hook in Northfield, Vermont, shows the next step. The center tower is now flat, and there are no curves in the casework. The pilasters of the center tower have Greek-style rectilinear fretwork in their upper surfaces. This ornamental treatment is identical to a doorway shown in Asher Benjamin's 1830 book, The Architect or Practical House Carpenter. This 1852 hook in Westville, Connecticut, on the left, shows the final stage of the Greek Revival case. The five sections have been reduced to three, and all the decoration is distinctly Greek. Instead of mahogany, the case is now painted pine. In other instances, it, would it was fake grained, as shown on the right, reflecting the changed taste in furniture decoration. Greek revival was only the first in a series of 19th century architectural revivals. Now, let's look at some others. Between 1750 and 1850, Britain changed from an agrarian to an industrial economy. With the introduction of power machinery, production shifted from rural crafts to urban industries. People left the countryside and moved to the larger regional towns to find work. These towns grew into cities and developed all the problems of large urban centers. By the 1820s, it was obvious that Britain was changing, but not necessarily for the better. In the 1830s and 1840s, when the industrial economy experienced its first slump, concern over the social consequences of industrialization came to a head. One of the first architects to question the situation was Augustus Welby Pugin. This is an illustration from his 1841 book, Contrasts, in which he contrasts the virtues of pre-industrial England with the vices of industrial England. This book was a protest against the ugliness of contemporary English cityscape. In the bottom half of the illustration, we see the pleasant environment of the English town of 1440, 
with all its church spires. In the top half, we see the same town in 1840 blighted by factories and smokestacks, those dark satanic mills of William Blake's poem. Pugin is one of the more interesting 19th century architects and was a force behind the Gothic revival in Britain. He's best known for the interior decorations of the Houses of Parliament. He was the precocious son of an architectural illustrator who had fled the French Revolution. Early on, he became obsessed with architecture and sailing. Pugin had an eventful, if short, life. He was designing furniture for Windsor Castle at age 15, was shipwrecked at 18, married at 19, widowed at 20, remarried at 21, converted to Roman Catholicism at 22, was widowed again at 32, remarried again at 37, and went mad and died at 40. <laughs> Pugin was a fanatical convert to Roman Catholicism who equated the virtues of England's pre-industrial past with the Catholic faith and the vices of his day with the Protestant Reformation. He considered Gothic architecture to be the only valid Christian architecture. He considered the classical architecture of Wren's London churches to be secular and pagan. In the 15 years between 1837 and his death in 1852, Pugin designed six cathedrals, over 40 churches, and dozens of seminaries, convents, and other religious buildings in England and Ireland. This is the Lady Chapel of St. Giles Church at Cheadle in Staffordshire, Pugin's most elaborate church. It was completed in 1848, four years before his death. Looking at the riot of color and ornament in this small space, one senses Pugin's brilliance and his obsessions. But if we ignore all the elaborate surface ornament and study the room's architectural lines, we discover that it is really quite plain. Even the window tracery is very simple. Pugin believed that the simple, early English style of Gothic was the most appropriate for churches. In his 1841 book, The True Principles of Pointed or Christian Architecture, he stated two important design principles which this chapel illustrates. First, there should be no features about a building which are not necessary for convenience, construction, or propriety. And second, all ornament should consist of enrichment of the essential construction of the building. Pugin was, in effect, crusading for a simple Gothic style with honest construction. Pugin also designed some organ cases. Here is one of several drawings he provided for Sir John Sutton's 1847 book, A Short Account of Organs Built in England. Pugin's designs show a clear understanding of the simple lines of historic Gothic organ cases. He designed this case for the chapel of Jesus College, Cambridge, where Sutton was the organist. Another important force behind the Gothic revival was the Oxford movement which grew out of an 1833 sermon preached there by John Keeble. This movement was, in essence, a rejection of the Protestant practices in the Church of England, which had developed in the 17th and 18th century. It called for a return to medieval Catholic forms of worship. And as many church musicians know, an important consequence was that Anglican church choirs and organs were moved out of the West Galleries and into the chancel. Though the founders of the Oxford movement were concerned primarily with spirituality, others had far more ambitious agendas. In 1836, a group of Cambridge University undergraduates who were preparing for the priesthood formed the Cambridge Camden Society, later known as the Ecclesiological Society. They shared an interest in medieval art and set about to reform church ceremony and to restore medieval church buildings. They upheld the Gothic as the only true Christian style. They announced their plans to influence the design of new churches by making measured drawings of selected medieval churches available to clergymen and their architects. A generation of churchmen fell under the Ecclesiological Society's influence. This is its seal, 
which was designed by Pugin. The first issue of the Society's newsletter, The Ecclesiologist, appeared in 1841. It announced the subjects which future articles would address. These included church building at home and in the colonies, the theory and practice of ecclesiastical architecture, the connection of architecture and ritual, the principles of church arrangements, church music and all the decorative arts which can be made subservient to religion, and criticisms upon designs for new churches. The Society's publications influenced clergy and architects on both sides of the Atlantic. Richard Upjohn, the architect of Trinity Church in New York City, owned issues of the first volume of The Ecclesiologist. He also owned a copy of Pugin's True Principles of Pointed or Christian Architecture. This 1841 illustration from Pugin's True Principles shows Pugin's design for an ideal church. And here is Upjohn's Trinity Church in New York, completed in 1846. It was strongly influenced by Pugin's design. Trinity Church elevated Upjohn's career and firmly established the Gothic Revival style as the model for Episcopal churches here for nearly a century. Upjohn's case design for Trinity's Henry Urban organ started a similar trend for American organ cases. Unfortunately, it looks more like a piece of Gothic architecture than a Gothic organ. I don't think that Pugin would approve. In fact, Pugin's old friend, Sir John Sutton, complained about similar organ, English organ cases. Let's look at an American Gothic revival case as I read you Sutton's comments. Every part of a church has been copied for the organ case, and attempts have been made at one time to make the organ look like a tomb, at another like a screen. At another, the canopies of the stalls have been placed on the top of the organ. Many of our cathedrals, college chapels, and parish churches are disfigured by these unsightly organ cases, which become every day larger and more heavy looking. And the ornamental parts resemble the barley sugar ornaments we see about Christmas time in pastry cook's windows. <laughs> One of the seminal events in the development of the organ, indeed in the development of Western architecture, decorative arts, and industry, took place in London in the summer of 1851. It was called the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations. This event marked the beginning of an international movement utilizing world fairs to popularize the fruits of industrial and technological progress. These fairs were called universal exhibitions because they presented displays of natural history and fine arts as well as manufactured goods. The purpose was to organize and display all of mankind's knowledge in one place. These exhibitions also filled a very practical need. Through these displays of new inventions of consumer goods from industrialized nations and ethnic products and raw materials from undeveloped territories and colonies, the world's middle class was introduced to a whole universe of consumer products. It is hard to overestimate the importance these exhibitions played in facilitating the acceptance of new technology and new design trends. Many things which we now take for granted were introduced as novelties at such fairs. The elevator, the Ferris wheel, the ice cream cone, moving sidewalks, touch tone dialing, the microwave oven, and electric action organs. Perhaps the most famous item at the Great Exhibition was the Exhibition Hall itself, which made architectural and engineering history. Punch Magazine nicknamed it the Crystal Palace. It was an extremely large five-aisled hall, 1,851 feet long, in honor of the year, nearly 400 feet wide and up to 111 feet in height. Constructed on site using modular components of glass, iron, and wood, it was completed in an astonishing 17 weeks. It was the first building to be constructed from standardized prefabricated elements. Industrial architecture was born, but it would take almost a century for such architecture to be accepted. In the 19th century, 
Iron and steel were considered unnatural materials, not worthy for use in serious architecture. While it became increasingly common to use them for factories, exhibition halls, and railway sheds, these utilitarian buildings were not considered to be architecture. Often, their iron and glass structures were hidden behind traditional facades of stone or brick. This architectural dichotomy permitted the use of new construction materials while satisfying the Victorian need for proper appearances. A similar thing happened with organ cases. The Industrial Revolution changed furniture making from a craft to an industry. And what is an organ case but a large piece of furniture? Prior to the 1850s, most organ cases also functioned as the structural frame which supported the wind chests. With the introduction of woodworking machinery and the rise of factory shops, it became more efficient to separate these two functions and farm them out to specialized departments. The case became a skin instead of an exoskeleton. This permitted the insides and the outsides of the organ to be built independently of one another, meeting only at final assembly stage. By the way, this is the Cincinnati Music Hall organ uh, set up in the hook shop without case. This new practice saved, saved time and money. It also permitted organ builders to offer a variety of case styles without having to redesign the organ's interior mechanism for each one. The same basic organ could be dressed in many different costumes depending on the situation. This too satisfied Victorian sensibilities. The 1851 exhibition showcased many innovations in organ tone and mechanisms and helped boost the career of several builders who exhibited there. But it was this instrument, displayed by the English firm of Gray and Davidson, that would have the most far-reaching effect on the future appearance of the organ. The lower portion of the case is quite traditional. But as you can see in the illustration, the absence of woodwork between or above the pipes clearly marks it as a Victorian object of the machine age. This organ marked a turning point in case design, the beginnings of the pipe fence. The photo on the right shows it in St. Anne Limehouse in London, where it still exists today, but with carvings added to the towers. With the change of furniture making from a craft to an industry, design had sunk to a low level during the first quarter of the 19th century. The organizers of the Crystal Palace exhibition hoped that such an exhibition of the finer pieces from all over the globe would elevate the taste of the general public. Unfortunately, it had the opposite effect. In an attempt to win prestige and gain customers, many manufacturers exhibited exaggerated gaudy pieces with a mixture of styles, Gothic, Renaissance, Elizabethan, Rococo, and even Near East. Eclecticism was let out of the barn and soon galloped into every Victorian home. Eventually it found its way to church, especially in America. Soon, American churches sported organ cases in an amazing variety of styles. Let's take a quick look at some of them. Keep in mind that these cases are loose interpretations of historic architectural styles. In addition to the Greek Revival and Gothic confections we've already seen, cases appeared in the Italianate style, such as this 1866 hook in Newburyport, Massachusetts. The basic inspiration here is the Roman triumphal arch. Here's an elaboration. Here's a simplification. The 1863 hook formerly at Immaculate Conception in Boston, has a Romanesque, Romanesque style variation designed by the church architect, Patrick Keeley. Here's a close-up of the Romanesque foliage on the column capitals. Here's a variation with Renaissance style bracket work. Here's a more obvious Renaissance style version. The central segmented pediment is the giveaway. This 1862 hook case in Brookline, Massachusetts is a variation of the Italian style known as Norman. The simple treatment of the arches and columns was meant to evoke the architecture of early English churches. 
The pipes are decorated with a repeating diaper pattern, as were Norman Cathedral piers. This 1860 hook case in Woburn, Massachusetts, seems to have an identity crisis. It has Norman, Renaissance, and classical elements, plus Moorish tops on the towers. It gives new meaning to the word eclectic. With the demon of historical eclecticism let loose in the organ world, it was only a matter of time before things would reach critical mass. What conditions would be necessary to create something really pretentious? Well, to start, let's throw together lots of money, the best or at least the most organ that money can buy, and a committee of musical amateurs who consider themselves artistic experts. So far, we have the makers of the typical big city church organ committee. But now, let's up the ante. Let's add a prominent architect to design the case and a high-end furniture maker to build it. Instead of a church organ, let's make it a civic organ. That way, we can throw in a healthy dose of pride as well as a desire to show off to the rest of the world. What would we get if we combined all these things? Well, in 18th century Holland, we'd get this. But we're talking about Victorian America. So after endless public debate, much planning, and a gestation period of six years, the baby is ready to be born. The music swells, the curtains part, the gas lights go up, and voila. The late Boston organist Jack Fisher used to ask first-time viewers, what do you think? Is it hideously elegant or elegantly hideous? <laughs> the answer is, it is both. The 1863 Boston Music Hall organ, now in Methuen, Massachusetts, has a case which sums up Victorian America's artistic pretensions and aspirations. The initial design by prominent Boston architect Hammett Billings was embellished and executed by the New York firm of Herder Brothers, who were furniture makers and decorators to the very wealthy. It is an architectural and allegorical tour de force. Though the facade pipe arrangement is somewhat French in design, the language of the elaborate casework is in high Italian Renaissance style. Larger than life size herms support the towers. That's the technical term for figures which grow out of those brackets such as these. These herms have gender identity issues. <laughs> are, they, are they plain looking women or artistically dressed men? There are lions, the king of beasts guarding the king of instruments. Beneath the two tallest towers, muscled atlases strain onto the weight of the 32 foots. Unlike the classical Roman examples which flaunted everything, these muscle men are discreetly draped to avoid upsetting Boston's Puritan sensibilities. However, one wonders if the ornament below the drape <laughs> was intended as a naughty little joke. <laughs> the panels below the impost have carved trophies of musical instruments and webs of strap work in Renaissance style. They display the names of famous composers, Cherubini, Palestrina, Mendelssohn, Handel, Gluck, and Mozart. On the two largest towers, cherubs sand atop domes reminiscent of St. Peter's in Rome. Above the center pipe flat, St. Cecilia sits upon the segmented pediment. Further below, a bust of Bach gazes sternly forward. Below him is the arch of the console niche, capped by a Renaissance-style head of a singing woman, a symbol of the organ's voice. This pecking order symbolizes the origins of music, or the musical food chain from heavenly harmonies to the great composers and then to the singing voice of the instrument. This is not just an organ case, it is a shrine to music. With it, the Boston Brahmin sent out a clear message. The great music of Western civilization had been reborn in the New World and Boston would carry it to the rest of the country. This organ case is an unrivaled piece of symbolic propaganda as well as sculpture. Of course, the Boston organ case also inspired several lesser imitations, such as this one built for the Mormon tabernacle in Salt Lake City in 1866. The gaudy eclecticism unleashed at the Crystal Palace did not go unchecked. It raised a huge negative reaction from many people in the arts. 
As a result, British artists, designers, and theoreticians set about to reform design and improve the level of public taste. Industrial training schools were reformed. Theoreticians and designers published guidebooks for decoration for the public. Books appeared with titles such as Hints on Household Tastes and What Shall We Do With Our Walls? The aesthetic movement was born. One of the most influential books was Owen Jones's 1856, The Grammar of Ornament, which took a scientific approach to design. Jones gathered and analyzed samples of all the world's ornamental traditions. From the structural language or grammar of these various decorative styles, he derived 37 general principles, propositions he called them, to serve as guidelines for decorative ornament. The final one sums up the mission of this new aesthetic movement. Quote, no improvement can take place in the arts of the present generation until all classes, artists, manufacturers, and the public are better educated in art, and the existence of general principles is more fully recognized, end quote. The aesthetic movement is epitomized by the entrance hall at Olana, the Hudson River summer home of American landscape painter Frederick Church. It was built at the height of the movement during the 1870s and 80s. This hall's decoration embodies Owen Jones's Proposition 4. True beauty results from that repose which the mind feels when the eye, the intellect, and the affections are satisfied from the absence of any want. <laughs> Nothing could be wanting in this space. <laughs> A new style of architecture also developed which was just as free. Traditional architecture was based upon symmetry and proportion. For centuries, buildings such as this late 18th century house were designed to form a pleasing symmetrical composition on the outside. The inside was then divided up as attractively as the shell allowed. There was good reason for this. The traditional post and beam method of construction with a mortise and tendon frame required that all joints be planned, cut, and fit before construction began. The simpler the layout, the quicker to build. An important construction innovation appeared in 1833. St. Mary's Church in Chicago was the first public building to be erected utilizing a skeleton of thin machine cut studs with a covering of clapboards, all held together by machine cut nails. Because of the lightness of this new type of construction, it was derisively called a balloon frame. Old timers predicted that the church would collapse, but within its lifespan, it was disassembled and re-erected three times. This development, which we now call stud framing, revolutionized building construction and made possible the rapid buildup of Western cities such as Chicago and San Francisco. By the 1870s, the stud frame had made the mortise and tenon frame obsolete. It allowed houses to become less formal. Architects began to experiment with new types of layouts on the insides and new shapes and surface treatments on the outside. The most elaborate new house style to appear was, was the Queen Anne. Now, the term is misleading because it has virtually nothing to do with Queen Anne nor the architecture of her period. This style is really the ultimate in decorated eclectic architecture. As wild as this building is, I can relate it to at least two of Owen Jones's prepositions. Number five states that construction should be decorated. Number 14 states that color is to be used to assist in the development of form and to distinguish objects or parts of objects from one another. Speaking of color, another development which facilitated its use was the invention of the paint tube in the 1840s and the paint can in the 1860s. Prior to that time, colored paint was custom made by painters who hand ground pigments and mixed them with oils. Now, paints could be factory prepared and shipped out pre-mixed. With this innovation, colorful paint became affordable to all. As I mentioned, the seeds of the aesthetic movement were sown at the Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851. 
25 years later, they reached full bloom. In 1876, the United States marked the 100th anniversary of American independence with a grand centennial exposition in Philadelphia. This fair attracted nearly 7 million visitors. It instigated a turning point in American design. Among the most elaborate and popular displays were furniture and fine arts from all over the globe. This was an eye-opener for most American visitors. They saw the latest in American and European styles. The English design move, reform movement was now in full bloom. The new style of furniture that had evolved was sometimes described as modern Gothic. It combined the honest construction Pugin had advocated in his writings about Gothic with the painted decorative ornament advocated in Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament. Some American firms exhibited similar furniture. They called this style Eastlake as it was loosely patterned after the design principles outlined in Charles Eastlake's 1872 book, Hints on Household Taste. It had straight line construction, sharp incised ornamental carving, marble tops, and painted ornament on flat panels. Two well-known American organ companies exhibited large instruments at the Philadelphia Exposition. Hilborn Roosevelt of New York built this three-manual organ, whose facade looks like an enlarged version of the Gray and Davidson pipe fence premiered at the Crystal Palace 25 years earlier. Despite its appearance, the Roosevelt organ displayed a distinct mechanical novelty. Two remote divisions controlled by electric action. And you can see uh, one of them floating up there. E and Gigi Hook and Hastings exhibited the other large organ. Since Boston was the American city closest in geography and temperament to England, it was not surprising that the visual design of their instrument was very much in the new British aesthetic style. It had simplified modern Gothic style casework with colored banding and stenciling on the pipes. This organ would set the standard for high style American organ cases for the next two decades. Gone were the Greek temples, the Gothic tabernacles, and the Roman triumphal arches with their gilded pipes. The organ's appearance would from henceforth be beautified with simple casework and tastefully applied painted ornament. When I was growing up, many people dismissed this style of facade as a painted pipe fence with bedposts and rails. But the Victorians saw it as a return to a simpler design. After all, didn't historic illustrations of early positive show horizontal or diagonal stays in front of the pipes and no casework above them? And as the organ evolved from a small G compass, compass instrument with one open diapason to a large scale instrument with several eights and perhaps a 16, these pipes had to go somewhere. If you've got it, flaunt it in the facade. The true art of these designs was in the creative arrangements of the pipes, achieved with little or no woodwork. There was also great artistry in the use of painted decoration to accentuate or minimize the mass of the pipes. Some of these pipe facades have an exciting, dynamic appearance. Unfortunately, many were later painted over, which robbed them of their visual interest. This 1882 Johnson organ in Baltimore illustrates Owen Jones's Proposition 10. Harmony of form consists in the proper balancing and contrast of the straight, the inclined, and the curved. Stencil pipes were an integral part of the aesthetic organ facade. Here are close-ups of the restored stenciling on the Johnson. They illustrate Jones's Proposition 13 that stylized rather than realistic representations of flowers should be used for ornaments. They also illustrate Proposition 31, that gold ornaments on any colored ground should be outlined with black. Following Jones' example, numerous other designers and art historians published pattern books of ornamental designs and stencils, which were used by organ builders. Here's an 1881 photograph of an E&G G. Hook and Hastings stock model organ. 
Notice the large stylized trefoil floral ornaments incised into the casework just below the outer pi pedal pipes. A similar trefoil pattern appears in the diaper ornament illustration shown on the right. That illustration appeared in a book published the same year in Liverpool entitled Outlines of Ornament in the Leading Styles. The authors were William and George Audsley. George later went on to write The Art of Organ Building. So far, I've shown you the conservative side of the aesthetic facade. Now, let's get radical. George Jardine was New York City's most progressive builder of the day. He was born in England and made occasional trips back, back home to keep abreast of the latest European trends. In 1864, <coughs> he built this organ for the New York City Church of St. John the Evangelist. This is the first example of what would be called the open style of pipe display. Notice the tasteful modern Gothic casework and the artistic stenciling. The hooks must have taken note of this organ. Four years later, in 1868, they built this organ for a Unitarian church in Stoneham, Massachusetts. But unlike that scandalous New York Jardine organ, which had naked pipes above the waist, this hook organ now in Lexington is a proper Boston lady who keeps her blouse on. <laughs> However, her neckline plunges to reveal a tattooed swell box. In 1879, Jardine built this organ for St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. One year later, Hook and Hastings built this for St. Patrick's Church in Roxbury, Massachusetts. One suspects that the pastor at St. Patrick's Church wanted an organ just like St. Patrick's Cathedral. Remember, monkey see, monkey do? Anyway, this organ is an amazing and important survival. In the 1890s, the aesthetic movement began to fade, but by raising the public's level of appreciation for artistry and everyday objects, it had sown the seeds for the arts and crafts movement and for Art Nouveau. At the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition held in Chicago, the pendulum swung decisively back to the conservative. Most of the exhibition halls were designed by American architects who had studied classical design in Paris at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts the School of Fine Arts. Thus, Beaux-Arts classicism became the new standard in American architecture. In the organ, architectural elements began to reappear above the impost. Once again, classical rationalism makes a comeback after a period of artistic exuberance. Ultimately, the pipe fence survived, but only as a vestige of its decorative past. This is the 1906 Hook and Hastings organ in the Christian Science Mother Church in Boston. The pipes are married to imposing architectural elements and gilded to be dignified brides. And here is the Woolsey Hall organ at Yale University, another arranged marriage between pipes and Beaux-Arts architecture. These high style facades can best be described as pipe fence meets architecture. Now, Let's look for a moment at something less restrained. While Beaux-Arts was spreading rationalism here, the more organic Art Nouveau style was becoming popular throughout Europe and some parts of the United States. A major objective of Art Nouveau designers was to revitalize the tired historicism in architecture and design. It was mostly used in interior design, furniture, and objet d'art. In essence, it was an offshoot of the aesthetic movement, characterized by organic lines and intricate patterns. The buildings of architect Antonio Gaudi in Barcelona, Spain, such as the Casa Batlo and the Sagrada Familia Cathedral are well-known examples of this style. Here's a delightful Art Nouveau case built by George Fenkadel in 1932 at the church of St. Boniface in bernhaupt le in northeastern France. Isn't that amazing? In the US, Louis Comfort Timphony made lamps and other objects in this style, but few American church committees or organ builders were brave enough 
to embrace Art Nouveau. However, Tiffany Studios built this elaborate casework for an 1896 Ferrand and Vody at the Church of Christ Uniting in Richmond Springs, New York. The organ was given by a single donor, so one assumes that no organ committees were harmed or offended in the process. <laughs> World War I brought Beaux-Arts and everything else to a crashing halt. The Great War, as it was called, marked the point at which the traditional battle techniques of Napoleon and Wellington, breastplates, horses, and charging the enemy, met with the killing machinery of the modern age, machine guns, high explosive shells, and poison gas. The losses were staggering, and virtually an entire generation of young men was wiped out in Europe. With the war's carnage ending an age of optimism, European artists totally rejected the classical forms favored by the military imperialists. In post-war Germany, a modern architecture movement arose it was born of economic necessity, a, a movement to improve workers' living conditions in the interests of social equality, equality and public health. In 1909, a new kind of design school was started at Weimar. It was called the Bauhaus. In 1925, the school moved to a new building in Dessau, designed by Walter Gropius, which we see here. The school's philosophy was based upon acceptance of the materials of industrial mass production, and rejection of academic conventions derived from the past. At its core was the belief that the 20th century was a new era whose people had new needs and that a new architecture should evolve to meet those needs. This new architecture would be rational, functional, economical, democratic, and international. The next major international exposition was held in Paris in 1925 and marked a turning point in European design. Promotional literature stated that reproductions, imitations, and counterfeits of ancient styles will be strictly prohibited. The exposition was intended to showcase works of new inspiration and real originality. The new style born of this exposition was called Art Deco and took its name from a shortening of the exposition's official title. Designers incorporated the materials and influence of modern industry, along with geometric motifs from African and Native American cultures. Forms were streamlined, and a futuristic effect was sought. Art was finally coming to terms with the machine age. Art Deco ornamentation consists largely of low-relief geometric designs, often in the form of parallel straight lines zigzags, chevrons, and stylized floral motifs. This 1931 Steinmeier organ at Blessed Sacrament Cathedral in Altoona, Pennsylvania is an excellent example of a deco-style facade. Here, the pipe tops and mouths create simple zigzag lines which obey the deco canon. European builders seemed more willing than American builders were to experiment with deco facades. Unfortunately, most American organs installed in deco buildings were placed behind geometric grills. A notable example is the 1933 Kimball in the War Memorial Auditorium in Worcester, Massachusetts. The grill facades at either side of the stage have flanking pipe towers, but these were dummies merely intended to advertise the presence of an organ. The deco style might have gradually found wider acceptance for churches and pipe organs. Unfortunately, the stock market crash of 1929 and the resulting depression wiped out many church endowments and crippled numerous organ projects. Deco fared much better in the secular sector. Many notable buildings and artworks in Deco style were produced by the WPA during the depression. In the post-war German organ world, there was also a rejection of artistic conventions of the past generation. In 1926, the Freiburg Organ Conference led to the beginnings of the Orgelbewegung, the organ reform movement, but the path these reformers took was different from that of the Bauhaus. They rejected the concept of the organ as a modern, industrially produced machine. Organ builders decided to look to the past, to the great instruments of the 17th and 18th century for new inspiration. Some began to experiment with 
higher pitch stops, unenclosed pipe placements, and mechanical action. In 1934, while most American organ builders were shoving oversized instruments into undersized black holes, the Cleveland firm of Votler Holt Camp Sparling built this organ for the rear gallery of St. John's Roman Catholic Church in Covington, Kentucky. Its visual design has simplified Gothic woodwork and exposed great and pedal pipework and recalls Jardine's open style instruments. Walter Holtkamp worked with architects and designers and eventually developed such exposed pipe arrangements into a signature visual style. In 1935, he built this charming deco-style three-stop mechanical action portative, which is owned by Brian Tim. In Paris, the 1937 Gonzalez rebuild of Cavier Cole's 1878 Trocadero organ remodeled the instrument with a functional pipe display. Gradually, exposed pipework came to be seen as a musically advantageous realization of the modernist canons of Form should follow function, and less is more. With the economic hardships caused by the Great Depression, many people became dissatisfied with capitalism. After all, it had gotten them into this mess. People in Western countries began to flirt with socialism. The National Socialists came to power in Germany, the fascist in Italy. Many people in the US developed communist or socialist sympathies. In times of political, economic, or social upheaval, people often develop a longing for the good old days. The Nazis promised Germany a return to a strong, stable government. As they consolidated their power and hatched plans to build an empire, they adopted the symbols of ancient Rome. Here you see the courtyard of Albert Speer's 1938 Chancellery Building in Berlin which used neoclassical architectural elements to display the might of the new regime. Modern art and architecture were condemned as degenerate by the Nazis, and the Bauhaus was closed down. At the advent of World War II, many leaders of the modern architecture movement fled Germany and sought refuge in the US, where they were welcomed with open arms and given key positions at the architecture schools of major universities. After the Second World War, modern architecture's moment finally arrived. The neoclassical architecture promoted by the Nazis might just as well have been condemned with them at Nuremberg. Modernism had been born of economic necessity in the 1920s Germany in the interest of social equality. Many of its proponents had long dreamed of tearing down the old cities and building new ones. Now, the bombing raids and artillery showings had done it for them. Western Europe was in ruins and rebuilding was needed as quickly and cheaply as possible. With traditional architecture discredited, modern architecture fit the bill. This is the new Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church in Berlin. It was built in the 1960s next to the bombed out ruins of the 19th century Romanesque revival one. Although the US did not suffer the loss of fabric that Europe did, the war had stopped most new construction. There was a pent-up demand for housing, schools, churches, offices, and factories. Here, too, modern architecture offered a quick fix. More important, the modernists had taken over the architecture schools. This is the 1968 Boston City Hall, not a colonial building. <laughs> Britain's King Charles III once observed that post-war development in London has caused more serious destruction to that historic city than all of the German bombing raids. Perhaps a similar thing might be said for American buildings and pipe organs as well. There were many bad examples of new churches and organs in the post-war period. The real problem is that time has not yet culled a sufficient number of the worst of them, as it traditionally has with other styles. But it is starting to, and for this we should all be thankful. Two names stand out in post-war American organ building, Walter Holtkamp and G. Donald Harrison. Let's look at what each one did with organ cases. 
Harrison, with his Willis and Aeolian skin of pedigree, is perhaps the more revered of the two. However, as far as organ casework is concerned, his record is uneven. Think of some of the instruments that Aeolian Skinner was famous for. Groton School, St. Paul School, the Mormon Tabernacle, and Church of the Advent. Now, think of their cases. All of these churches have elaborate cases which were retained from previous organs. St. Paul's School, which you see here, used the 1887 Hutchings case. St. Mary the Virgin in New York City had no case at all. True, an elaborate case design was proposed, but due to limited funds, Harrison advised putting the money into pipes. In instances where the company designed and provided new casework, the results were not felicitous. Here is St. Paul's Cathedral in Boston. Is this an organ case or a display rack in a drapery showroom? <laughs> In a letter to William King Covell, Harrison explained that the drapes were intended as a temporary measure to save money, but we all know how temporary measures become permanent. The drapes were eventually removed, but does it look better? On the other hand, Walter Holkamp did no cases at all. He continued to design highly original pipe displays which were lauded as the perfect complement to modern church architecture. Some of his firm's asymmetrically cantilevered arrangements are visually poetic. They call to mind the floating horizontal planes of Frank Lloyd Wright's 1937 masterpiece, Falling Water. Ironically, Holkamp's most stunning visual masterpiece was ex executed by another firm. Hired as a government's consultant, he provided visual designs and technical specifications for the two chapel organ for the new U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. The 1963 Moeller organ in the Protestant Cadet Chapel, seen on the left, is considered one of the icons of 20th century post-war American organ building. In 1957, Joseph Blanton published his landmark book, The Organ in Church Design. It opened the eyes of architects and organ builders to the fact that pipe organs could be things of visual beauty. His second book, The Revival of the Organ Case, appeared in 1965. It illustrated the visual and musical merits of housing the organ in a well-designed, freestanding case. From that point onward, casework, simple and modern, of course, became the new visual style for organs. Even electric action unit organs, such as the one we saw at the beginning of this lecture, were dressed up to look like modern European trackers. And in instances where a traditionally designed tracker organ went into a, to a traditional interior, modernism still held sway. The 1967 Fisk at Harvard's Memorial Church, now removed, had a classically proportioned case and sat in an elegant neoclassical interior. Yet, the simplistic treatment of the case moldings and pipe shade carvings revealed it unmistakably as a follower of the fashion of its time. In the late 60s and early 70s, cracks appeared in the world of modernism. Some architects began to realize that the modern international style did not hold all the answers. The elegant simplicity and technical perfection that pioneers of modernism envisioned had given way to cheap, boring, mass-produced monoliths. As the world's major cities filled up with look-alike glass and steel boxes, one critic paraphrased the modernist canon of less is more into less is a bore. It rang true. Several key events shook people's faith in modernism as the reigning architectural religion. In 1963, New York's Penn Station was demolished to make way for a new, boring Madison Square Garden arena and office building. The 1910 station had been designed by McKinn, Mead, and White as a replica of the ancient Caracalla Baths in Rome. It was considered a civic masterpiece. Its destruction shocked and outraged New Yorkers and led the city to adopt a landmarks preservation law in 1965. In 1972, the city of St. Louis dynamited a vast modern high-rise housing project, which was only 17 years old. The project's buildings had won an award from the American Institute of Architects. But its modernist design was so impractical for everyday life that even the poor didn't want to live there. 
1978, architect Philip Johnson designed a new headquarters for AT&T in New York City. It was a skyscraper with a top like a Chippendale bookcase. This set the architectural establishment on its ear. Two years later, Michael Graves designed this municipal office building for Portland, Oregon. It rejected the modernist canon of uniform exterior treatment and incorporated large decorative motifs. Instead of glass curtain walls, it used heavy masonry and small windows. It also brought color back into architecture. It has been called the first postmodern building. After they caught their breath, architects on both sides of the Atlantic began to realize that their modernist prison doors had been opened and they were set free. Some years earlier, comparable things had begun to happen in the organ world. In 1972, Charles Fisk built this organ for Boston's Old West Church. The 1806 building was designed by American architect Asher Benjamin. The main case utilizes parts of a three-towered Thomas Appleton case, which Fisk expanded to four. The Rook Positive case was built new in a complementary style. The organ looks perfectly at home in the restored federal interior. This was a brave thing to do at the time. Boston was still very much a bastion of modern design and architecture. Also in 1972, John Brombaugh built this organ for the Ashland Avenue Baptist Church in Toledo, Ohio. Suddenly, two new American organs had appeared with classically detailed cases and elegant carvings instead of modernist plywood boxes. Organ builders, too, were set free. Now, I'm not going to talk about other case design trends of the last 50 years. Each of us has our own personal experiences and interpretations of them. Suffice it to say that the field then became wide open. Finally, to end this saga on the repeated cycles of time taste in the organ case, let's take a quick look at another famous concert hall organ. In 1997, architect Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, took the architecture world by storm. His curvaceous buildings, which are more like shimmering three-dimensional sculptures, brought architecture way beyond the decorated boxes of postmodernism, just like what the Baroque did to the classical world. His Walt Disney Concert Hall in downtown LA did likewise. And this is the unique facade he designed for the Disney Hall pipe organ. People either love it or hate it, but one thing cannot be denied. This facade in the principal concert hall of one of America's principal cities explodes the general public's concept of the organ as a staid box of whistles and gives the message that the pipe organ is very much alive and up to date in the 21st century. People come for the french fries and stay for a serving of organ music. <laughs> the Disney Hall organ makes a bold, as bold a visual statement about its time as the Boston Music Hall organ did in its time. Just make it visually compelling and people will notice. Now, for those of you who've stayed awake and enjoyed this presentation, I have a few bonus shots of unusual European organ cases which you might enjoy seeing. Europeans seem to be more willing to have fun with their organ cases. First, the Hand of God organ at Notre Dame des Neiges, Our Lady of the Snows Church in Laut de Ruiz, a ski village in the Alps in France. The organ was built in 1978 by Detlef Kloiker. The case was designed by the church's architect, Jean Marot. Now, the church interior and exterior, which you see on the left, are also quite stunning. The church, dedicated in 1969, was designed to represent a round tent. And the cylindrical concrete tower, which forms the chancel, is in effect the tent pole and supports all the roof beams. This church and organ prove that with good visual design, you can draw the world's attention to the middle of nowhere even a remote alpine ski village. Next, I have a few Art Nouveau organ case pictures sent to me by Goran Grand, the former ISO secretary who lives in Sweden, at the recent ISO Congress. And I lamented to him that there are so few Art Nouveau organ cases. So he said, oh, I can send you some. 
This is the 1915-1930 Ackerman and Lundorg in Stockholm's Salzjobaden Church, designed in 1915 by architect Ferdinand Boberg. It's kind of unusual. This is the organ in Stockholm's Engelbrecht Church as it originally looked. Here's a close-up of that photo. Isn't that cool? Sadly, in 1960, the facade design was modernized to what you see here. This is Stockholm's Holgelid Church, built in 1923. The original organ was by Ackerman and Lund. Those are slats, they're not pipes, but it kind of gives the illusion of, you know, it's, a pipe. it's a kind of nifty screen. This is the Vasa Church in uh, Gothenburg. The church was built in 1909 in the neo-romantic style with decorative details in the Art Nouveau style. This organ case certainly looks different. The, the two towers remind me of the hilts of swords. And now a quick detour to France. This organ in the Protestant Church of St. John in Wissenburg, France was visited during the ISO Congress last month. It was built in 2015 by Dominique Thomas. And uh, the LED lights that wrap it uh, can change color. It reminds me of a Hamburg organ imprisoned on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> and finally to Germany, I think. It's the, it's the New Jersey diner style. <laughs> 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 Touche. A Hamburg, di a Hamburg diner. <laughs> and finally to Germany, I, th I think. I found some interesting case photos online and saved them. They were not identified, so I know nothing about these organs other than they piqued my visual interest. I don't know the purpose of the wooden grates, maybe to keep birds out of the pipes. I call this a peekaboo organ for obvious reasons. <laughs> Obviously, this pipe facade was intended to not make a visual statement. And it doesn't really invite the viewer's curiosity. From the look of it, I'd expect the, expect the full organ to sound like a soft Dolce Cornet. <laughs> and finally, something completely different. I'd call this Disney Hall meets Crayola. <laughs> I'd love to know how much the paint job cost. The visual message I get from this organ facade is that this organ is so bursting with tonal colors that the pipes just can't contain themselves. And I thank you all for containing yourselves and sitting through this presentation.